Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this first science lesson of the fourth term. I hope that you had a good break. I hope that you used the break to prepare for the final exams. Um, okay, it's fine if you didn't, but it really would be good if you did. Okay, so in this lesson, what I would like to do is I would like to continue doing what we did the last time I was doing lessons with you, which is I would like to carry on by going through the exam paper questions of the work that we've already completed and then once we've done that then I will carry on working through the rest of the curriculum. Um, there's not much more to do but we've done the major sections. So it says a man and a woman each wearing roller skates. Oh sorry by the way all these questions come out of old exam paper questions and there are paper one and paper two questions in this um, section because obviously I'm doing all the questions that we've done so far. So it says a man and a woman each wearing roller skates standing facing each other on a flat frictionless horizontal surface. The man pushes the woman and the woman moves to the right at four meters per second. Okay, it says state the principle of conservation of linear momentum. Okay, so by doing this, by asking you to do this, what are they doing? They're basically hinting that we're going to be needing to use the conservation of linear momentum in order to solve this problem, whatever the problem may be. So the principle of conservation of linear momentum is just that the linear momentum in a lin moment, sorry, linear momentum in an assay system is conserved. And if you really want to, you can be specific and say both in magnitude and direction. Now it says the masses of the man and the woman are 80 and 50 kgs respectively. So the man is 80 kgs and the woman is 50 kgs. Okay. And it says, how does the impulse on the woman compare to that of the man? Write down only greater than, smaller than, or equal to. Now this is an interesting question because if they had to ask you about momentum, that would be different. But what is impulse? Impulse is F delta T. That is the formula for impulse. Okay, so Newton's third law says that if body A exerts a force on body B, then body B exerts an equal but opposite force on body A. So do you agree that the man should be pushing the woman with the same force as the woman is pushing the man? And that is Newton's third law. So therefore for both the man and the woman, the force is the same. They're in the opposite directions, but they're the same. Similarly, the amount of time that they're in contact with each other is obviously the same. So actually, the impulse on the woman compared to that of the man is actually equal to each other. Even though the man is going to end up moving at a different velocity to the woman because of his mass. Now it says calculate the man's velocity immediately after pushing the woman away from him. Okay, so therefore in order to do this we're going to use P before equals P after. So the P before they are standing facing each other, standing facing each other on a flat frictionless horizontal surface. So the P before is the, ma the mass of the man and the woman and the initial velocity of the man and the woman because they are touching each other, they are one object, okay? They then move off and there's the mass of the man, the final velocity of the man, plus the mass of the woman, the final velocity of the woman. And guys, you really need to learn how to do these subscripts because it's very important. They actually allocate marks to get these subscripts right and obviously it doesn't have to be identical as long as you know what you're talking about, okay? And it looks like it makes sense. Okay, now do you agree that the initial velocity of the two as they're standing together, because they're standing facing each other, the initial velocity is zero. So because this initial velocity is zero, the whole of the left hand side is zero. Da -ding! Equals. And now what we need to do is we need to decide which direction is positive. And since they mentioned that the woman is traveling, okay, to the right, or well, the woman has been moved off at four meters per second, I'm going to choose her direction as positive, okay? 
So we've got the mass of the man, which is 80, multiplied by the velocity of the man, which is what we're working out, okay? Plus the mass of the woman, which is 50, multiplied by the velocity that she had, which is 4. So we've got 80, velocity of the man, plus 200, so you've got minus 200 is equal to 80 VFM. So therefore you've got that VFM is equal to minus 200 divided by 80. So we need to get out our calculator and move it over and go, well, that's 200 divided by 80 which is going to be 5 over 2, which is obviously 2.5. So it's negative 2.5 meters per second. And that is VFM. Or you could say his velocity is 2.5 meters per second to the left, which is probably a better answer, especially because they have asked you for the velocity, which means you should be including a direction. Now let's just calculate the impulse on the woman. So we know that impulse is F delta T, which is also equal to delta P. And the reason I mention that is because we don't have the time that, we don't know the force, okay, we don't. And we also don't have the time that they're in contact. But we do know that impulse is equal to change momentum. And we can work out the change in momentum of the woman because that is MVF minus VI. So the mass of the woman is 50. Her final velocity is 4 minus the initial, which is going to be 200. And what is impulse measured in? Newton's seconds. And there you go. So the impulse on the woman is 200 Newton seconds. Okay, so I think the only tricky question really in that lot was this one. That was a nice, interesting question. Right, let's go on to circuits. Okay, in the circuit below, the battery has an EMF of 12 volts and there is an internal resistance of R. The three resistors, and okay, sorry, there's a re the three resistors, oh, and a bulb. Sorry, this is the bulb. I was looking for more resistors. Okay, the three resistors and the bulb are connected as shown in the diagram. The resistance of the bulb is 2 ohms, they've told us. Initially, both switches S1 and S2 are open. Assume that all the connecting wires and the ammeter has a negligible resistance. Okay, so we've got all the switches open. Okay, and it says, when only switch S1 is closed, the reading on the voltmeter drops to 10.8 volts. So let's have a look at what's happening here. If that's the case, it goes along here and then it goes along here and it goes la 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 la, along here, along there, along there and back there. So that is our circuit at the moment. And at that point in time, although the EMF is 12 volts, the voltmeter reading is now 10,8. That is the actual volts that are going to the circuit. Okay. It says calculate the reading on the ammeter. Calculate the reading on the ammeter. So do you agree that from Ohm's law, we got V is equal to IR? Okay, or we can say I is V over R. We know the bolts going to the circuit is 10.8. We can also work out the resistance. It's very easy because it's a nice series circuit. So it's just 6 plus 6. Okay, so that's 12. So if we pop that in the calculator, there it is. Oh, sorry, I seem to have skipped. And then let's go, there we go. So we go 10 point, no, let's try again. 10.8, 10.8 divided by 12 equals 0,9. So the ammeter at this point in time is really 0,9 amps. Okay, so 
you guys had to know or had to realize that the 10.8 was now the valve being supplied the circuit. You had to realize that with switch S1, this was the circuit that was happening and that this current wasn't going through a 3 ohm and it wasn't going through a 2 ohm resistor. And you had to add up the resistance in series to make that 12 ohms. Okay, so now we've got that. Now it says work out the internal resistance R of the battery. Okay, so we know that EMF is equal to volts to the circuit plus the volts lost. Okay, but do we agree that volts lost is equal to I little r? So we can work out the last volts. We've got, we started with 12 and now we've got 10.8. So do you agree that the last volt is 1,2 volts, okay? The difference between the EMF and the volts that we got to the circuit is now 10,8. That is equal to the current, which now we know now is 0 0.9, multiplied by little r, okay? Therefore, we can say 1,2 divided by 0 0,9 is equal to r, so again, we just need our calculator and I don't know, I went past it again. So we've got 1.2 divided by 0.9, hmm, 0.9 equals 1.3333. So internal resistance is 1,33 recurring. Okay, so little r is 1,33 recurring. Okay, now, both switches, S1 and S2, are closed and the ammeter reads 1.5 amps. So now, both switches are closed and now the ammeter reads 1.5 amps. Okay, so now it reads 1.5. So you can see that the current has gone up. And obviously the reason the current has gone up is because the resistance has decreased. It now says calculate the power dissipated in the bulb. They want to know what is the power in the bulb. Okay, so first of all, let me just erase all this writing here so we can get rid of it. And then we can talk about the equations that we have for our use with respect to the bulb. Okay, so let's talk about the equations and the power. So the first equation, you get a whole list of equations for power on your formula sheets, okay? And you mustn't be overawed by it, okay? It's actually very useful. What it says is power is work over your change in time, which is equal to VI, which is equal to I squared R, which is equal to V squared over R. Okay, right. So obviously we don't have any time in here, so we're not going to use that. Okay, we cannot use the volts because first of all, we don't know how many volts are going straight over the resistor. And secondly, this 10.8 doesn't exist anymore because it's changed now that we have um, closed S2, okay? So therefore we cannot use the volt equation. So we have to use P is equal to I squared R. So what we need to now work out is how much current is going through this dude here. Okay, now there are a couple of ways to do it, but one of the ways to do it is to go, okay, fine. We know that if I had to redraw this, just this bit here, let me just change color. I'm just going to redraw that bit. Okay, so we've got this here, which is six ohms, and then we've got this here, which is three ohms, and then we've got the light bulb, which is two ohms. Okay, and then they come together. Okay, and here's the battery. There's the battery. There's other stuff happening over here, yes, yeah, another six ohm, but we don't care. We're only worried about this bit here. So now, do you agree that the current at the moment in the main circuit is 1.5 amps? So the 1.5 amps is coming in here, 1.5, and it splits up, okay? 
and then it rejoins and comes back together again and this is 1.5 amps. Okay, so we could do like a reverse pro rata thing, which is fine, and I'm very happy to show you how to do that. But the other way is to realize that volts are equal in both parts of the circuit. Okay, the volts are equal in both parts of the circuit. Um, no, that's not actually going to help us. Let's rather do the current thing. Okay, so do you agree the ratio for the current is 6? to 5. This is 6 ohms and that is 5 ohms. So how many parts do we have all together? Do you agree we've got 11 parts? Now what you need to realize is that 5 out of the 11 parts of the 1,5 amps is going to go through the top branch and 6 out of the 11 amps of the 1.5 amps is going to go through the bottom branch and that's what we want. We want to know what that current is so we can work out the power. So let's get out our calculator and we're going to say, okay, fine. Our fraction is, oh, what did I just do? What did I just do? Okay, our fraction is 6 over 11 multiplied, oh, what is going on? Delete. Multiplied by 1.5 equals 9 elevenths, okay, or not point, okay, we're leaving it as 9 elevenths. So the current I is 9 elevenths, 9 elevenths of an amp, okay, that's the current that is going through this section here, through the, the 2 ohm light bulb. Now we want to know the power, so power is equal to 9 over 11 squared multiplied by this resistance of 2. So let's go and get out our calculator and we're going to square this and then we're going to multiply it by 2 and it becomes 1.34. 1, 1,34 and then obviously what is the units for power? The power is watts. So that is 1.3 watts. That's the power. Okay. Now it says, what effect will closing the both switches have on the lost volts? Write down only increases, remains the same, or decreases, and fully explain your answer. Okay, so this is an interesting concept, okay? What happens is, okay, it's complicated. E is equal to V to the circuit plus V lost, okay? And the V lost is equal to I little r. Okay. Now it's saying what effect will have the closing of both switches have on the last valve. So what's interesting about this is that by closing the switch, okay, you are decreasing the external resistance. So you're decreasing the external resistance. But what that means is that your current is flowing faster. Okay, the current is going faster. So at this point in time, hang on, let me just, let me just, okay, let me just, I'll tell you what, let's just erase the link. Okay, so you got EMF is equal to I big R plus I little r. Okay, when we close both the switches, do you agree the total external resistance of the circuit goes down? Okay, it goes down. Therefore, the current is going to go up. Okay, the current is going to go up. And for that reason, your last volt actually increases. What did I say? Vast volt. Your last volt actually increases because the internal resistance actually increases because the greater the speed at which the electrons are flowing through the battery, the greater the internal resistance. So therefore, if you make it easier for the electrons to flow through the circuit, your internal resistance actually increases. Okay, and that is the answer to that question. Sneaky one, hey? Right, now let's do some chemistry. Do you remember organic chemistry? Well, we're doing organic chemistry. Okay, so what's interesting about this question and pops out at me immediately is you'll see that it says the alkene brackets major product. Now, if you go read the CAPS document and the exam guidelines, they tell you that you do not need to worry about major product and minor product. 
Okay, they tell you that. Yet here is a question that I took out of an old exam paper that is already in the caps. Okay, all these questions come out of the caps, old caps papers, and it asks you for a major product. So obviously, there's a bit of a problem there. Okay, just a second, I just need to do something. Sorry, um, it was looking like it was going to cut off, so I just needed to restart something. Okay, right, so now it says, so what I'm saying to you about this major product and the minor product is that if you disobey the rules of how things join, okay, as in which carbon they're going to join on, um, with McCovney-Cove's rule, then you don't have to worry about major product or minor product, okay? So it says, and I'll explain it to you as we go, the flow diagram below shows two organic reactions in which two chlorobutane reacts with potassium hydroxide under different reaction conditions, okay? The first one is two chlorobutane with potassium hydroxide gives you an alkene, okay? And yeah, you've got two chlorobutane with potassium hydroxide that gives you an alcohol. So it says use the information in the flow diagram to answer the questions below. And it says what type of reaction is reaction A? And reaction A is a sub reaction one is a substitution reaction. They are swapping the chlorobutanes, the chloros, for the hydroxyl to form an alcohol. Okay. Next it says the IUPAC name of the alcohol and I'm assuming that they mean for reaction one. Okay, so if that was the case, do you agree you've got butane? I'll draw it out for you. It says one, two, three. Oh, it says for the alcohol, so it's obviously reaction one, shame. Okay, on the second carbon there was a chlorobe, now there is a hydroxyl. So therefore there's going to be two butanol or if you want you can say it's butan to all. Okay. Now the next question says which one of the reactions one or two uses concentrated potassium hydroxide? Which one of these two okay uses concentrated potassium hydroxide and that is a theory question which you guys should learn okay i'm going to give you some time to think about that and i'm going to move on to the next question i'll come back to in a second if i can get a pen what is going on oh, sorry just a second don't know what's going on. Okay, so before we carry on with talking about concentrated potassium hydroxide and which other one we would use, obviously we're looking at concentrated potassium hydroxide versus dilute potassium hydroxide. So you, I need you to think about what is actually happening here in reaction two. In reaction one, there is substitution happening, right? What is happening in reaction two? In reaction two, we're actually moving, removing what? We are dehydrogenating it. Do you agree? We are taking a chlorobutane. So we're moving the chlorine and the butane, I mean a hydrogen, to form an alkene and it's going to be a butene. We just need to work out where that hydrogen is going to be. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. It's going to be, okay, I just want to show you what's happening here. We've got two chlorobutanes, so we've got one, two, three, four, and there's your Cl, okay? What's going to happen is it's going to remove this hydrogen and that chlorine and you end up with the major product which is actually C dash C double bonded C dash C plus HCl. So that is D hydro it's dehydrohalogenation. Dehydrohalogenation. And dehydrohalogenation can only occur with a concentrated potassium hydroxide. And that is why you need to know that this is dehydrohydrogenation. So the reaction is 
Reaction two is the one that you use for your concentrated potassium hydroxide. You could also use concentrated sodium hydroxide, and that only works when you have dehydrohalogenation. Then it says write down the structural formula of the alkene. Well, I'm busy doing it. It's C dash C double bonded C dash C. And then we need to put some hydrogens on, one, two, three, and one, two, three. So it's hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Okay, and also just for the record, it makes sense then that if you had a concentrated potassium hydroxide, then obviously what they're talking about here is a dilute potassium hydroxide with the substitution. Right, next question, it says, a small sample of propyl methanoate. So what is that? That is obviously an ester. It's an ester. It's prepared in the school lab using an alcohol and a carboxylic acid in the presence of a catalyst. The reaction of mixture is heated in a water bath. Right down there, one reason why the reaction mixture is heated in a water bath instead of heating it directly. Okay, well, the main reason is that alcohol is highly, highly flammable. So what you want to do is heat it, but you want to have it like a little bit of a degree away from the flame, open flame. So therefore you heat it, the water, you heat the water and the water then heats the actual reaction mixture. Okay, so therefore we can say the reason we heat the reaction mixture in the water bath is to prevent the thing from exploding by coming into contact with a flame. Right, then it asks the structural formula of the alcohol. Okay, so if you have propyl methanoate, what you need to know is that this year used to be the alcohol and this year used to be the carboxylic acid. Okay, so now they want the, the structural formula of the alcohol. So therefore, the structural formula of the alcohol is going to be propanol. So it's going to be C dash C dash C O dash H and then the rest of it is all hydrogens. Hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Okay, so that is the structural formula of the alcohol. And then they want the IUPAC name of the carboxylic acids. Very easy. It's just me the noic acid, methanoic acid. Right, next question. Okay, so now we get on to a little bit more interesting questions. It says, there are three chain isomers having the molecular formula C5H12. So what does that mean? It means that all these carbon compounds have got five carbons and 12 hydrogens, but they are chain isomers. It means that they're isomers of each other, but they're still in the chain form, okay? It means they've just really got different main chain lengths, okay? In a practical investigation, the vapor pressure data for the three chain isomers, A, B, and C, is collected and plotted on a graph, as shown below, okay? So, you've got the vapor pressure, and you can see that the vapor pressure is increasing, versus, and it's increasing as the number of branches increases. Okay, that's interesting. So, the vapor pressure is increasing as the number of branches is increasing. It says to find the term chain isomer. So, all that you need to say is that um, an isomer, first of all, is um, organic compounds that have the same number of carbons and the same number or same number of constituent elements, but they're obviously rearranged. Okay. Um, okay, but um, a chain isomer is are isomers that are still remain in the chain form. In other words, they don't form rings. Um, now it says use the graph to estimate the vapor pressure of the straight chain isomer C5H12 at 20 degrees. Okay, so this was the vapor pressure at 20 degrees. And then it says, and this was the straight chain isomer at 20 degrees. And it says use graph to estimate the vapor of the straight chain isomer C5H12 at 
20 degrees. Um, so I would just read it off. A straight chain means that there's no branches. So I would say that that is 50 kilopascals. Okay, now it says write down the structural formula of compound C. Now the number of branches of C is two. So C has got two branches um, and it's C5H12. So instead of it having five carbons, it's going to have what? It's going to have one, two, three, and it has to have the two carbons here. Because if the as two branches here, because if the branch was here, then it'd be a straight chain of four. And if it was here, it would also be a straight chain of four. So therefore it has to look like this. And then you've got your hydrogens, 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 hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Okay, you get the gist. So this is what the structural formula of compound C would be. This is C. Okay. Then it says explain the difference in the vapor pressure of compounds A and B. In your explanation, refer to the structure of the molecule, the type of strength of type and strength of the intermolecular forces. Okay. So what you need to say in this is you've got to mention all the things that they've put in big and bold and capital letters. Okay, first of all, you need to say that obviously B has got at least one branch, whereas A has no branches. Okay, so A is straight chain, no branches. B has got at least one branch. Secondly, you can see that the vapor pressure has increased for B. But what does that mean? It means that it's much easier to break the bonds. Okay, because the higher the vapor pressure, the lower the um, temperature at which the liquid will vaporize. Okay, so what we can say is that it seems to be that the, and it's pretty obvious from this graph, that the more branches, the higher the vapor pressure, which means the more branches, the weaker the bonds. Okay. And that's what you need to say. You need to say that the type of bond is weak um, London forces because these are all alkanes. Whether they be branched or not, they're still alkanes. C5H12, CN2N plus 2. Um, hang on, let me think about that. CNH. Yeah, it's, 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 they're all alkanes. Um, and what you need to think about is the fact that. Um, so we know that they all got London forces, which are very weak, but uh, the more branched they become, the greater the surface area, and therefore the weaker the London forces, and therefore the greater the vapor pressure. There you go. That's how easy this is. Now it says the learners also conducted boiling point data for compounds D, E, and F as shown in the table below. So it's D, which is going to be methanol, E, which is one, two, three, so it's propanol, and F, which has got nothing to do with hydroxyls, it's got, it's chloromethane, dichloromethane. How is that possible? That's not possible. Why do I say it's not possible? Because carbon's only got one, carbon's got one, two, three, four, you, and hydrogen's got one arm and chlorine's got one arm, so therefore it's going to be H, H, this is not possible. <sighs> oh, there's supposed to be a two there, CH2, that's a typo on the exam paper, sure. If you look over here, CF2, CL2. Okay, right, now it says, write down the name of the type of intermolecular force that is responsible for the difference in the boiling points of compound D and compound E. And what you're looking for are hydrogen bonding. Compound D and E have got 
hydroxyl groups. And anything with an hydroxyl group, we can say, has got a hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is much stronger than your London forces. So it says right down the name of the type of intermolecular force, it's just hydrogen bonding. 4.5.2 says explain the difference in the boiling points of D and E by referring to the type and strength of the intermolecular forces. Okay, so D has got strong hydrogen bonding, whereas F has got weak London forces. Therefore, D will definitely have a higher boiling point than F. Okay, compound F is prepared at standard conditions, SCP, by reaction between methane and chlorine as follows. So it's methane plus chlorine gives you uh, dichloromethane plus hydrogen. Okay, first of all, it says write down the name of the type of the reaction that leads to the formation. It's just substitution. All that you can, you can see it was just substitution. All we've done is we've taken some of the Cl2s and popped it onto this molecule and we've kicked out some hydrogen. So that is just substitution. Then it says in the reaction, ah, a little bit of stoichiometry, yay. Okay, in the reaction. 21,88 decimeters cubed of methane produces 0.043 kilograms of CH2Cl2. Calculate the percentage yield of this reaction. Okay, so let's do some maths and some science. So we've got CH4 gas plus Cl2 gas gives us CH2Cl2 gas plus H2 gas. Okay. So first of all, they tell us that we've got 21,88 decimeters cubed. But we know what? We know that one mole occupies 22.4 decimeters cubed. So we can find the number of moles of CH4. We can say 21.88 divided by 22.4 equals... 0.98. So we've got 0.98 moles of methane. We end up with 0.43 kilograms, 0.043 kilograms of the stuff. But that needs to be changed to grams. So how do you do that? You multiply by a thousand. So we're going to go 0.043. Let's try again. 0.04. 3. We're going to multiply it by a thousand. Oh, what is going on with this calculator? Times by a thousand equals 43. So this is 43 grams. That is what we actually got. But we want the number of moles. So we know number of moles is mass over molar mass. And the formula for this, we want the molar mass of CH2 Cl2. So carbon is definitely 12 plus 2 times hydrogen, which is 2, plus 2 times chlorine, which is 35, 45. Okay, so let's get out our calculators. So we've got 12 plus 2 times 2 is 4 plus bracket 2 times 35, 0.45 close bracket equals, um, which is 86.9. So the molar mass is 86,9. Therefore, the number of moles that we actually got out, the number of moles is 43 divided by 86,9, which is what? Okay, so we want 43 divided by 86,9 equals 0.494. So we got out 0.494 moles. Or 0.49 moles. Okay, so what is our percentage yield? Do you see that the ratio of this is 1 to 1? So obviously what should have happened is that we should have got, if we put in 0.98 moles, we should have got out 0.98 moles. But instead we only got out 0.49 
So therefore we can say 0, 0,49, which is what much you got out, divided by 0 0.98, which is how much we put in, times by 100 over 1 is going to give us a percentage yield. So we're going to go 0 0.49, let's try again, 49 divided by 0 0.98 equals, and it's 50%. So that there is 50%. Right, grade 12. Tomorrow we're going to carry on with those four or five questions. And then on Wednesday, we will start carrying on with new work. Have a great evening. Cheers.